Here we are, here we are at the Mental America podcast with Jose Rigo, Joe Rigo, Joey Bag of Donuts, and one of the most acclaimed and locally famous chef in this area. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Thank you. Thank you for having me here. So, thank you, Joe, for coming. Yes. Let's, let's, let's start it off by um, talking about uh, where it all began for you. I like to, you know, when you have guests on, Talk about where it started. As a, as a childhood, where you were born, and let's go from there. Uh, all right. So um, I was actually born um, in West Africa in Angola, uh, in the capital of Angola, Luanda. Uh, was the reputation? Um, I'm just, you know, just um, you know, being born yeah, in Africa. Yeah. <laughs> the, the, you know, uh, the Civil War happened in 1974, and in, uh, I was born in 71, so I wasn't there very long. But uh, I know uh, that during the time during Revolution, I know that my parents basically had to, uh, you know, leave the country with their clothes, only their clothes on their back. You know, we had uh, an ice cream business with several stores, uh, I believe a factory uh, how houses, cars, all that we have. Interesting. Believe. So you, yeah, parents owned uh, an ice they, cream. Yeah, uh, like, my, it, with my family, with my aunts, my uncle, my grandmother, my they, grandfather. They would make they, it from scratch. Yeah, they would make it from scratch. Yeah, in an ice cream business. So we left everything behind. They left everything behind in, uh, at the start life over. Um, I went to settle in Lisbon after Angola. We stayed there. I stayed there for until I was twelve years old, and then at twelve years old, I. Immigrated to the United States with my parents uh, and settled here in New Bedford. Bedford, Mass. You, yeah. Uh, so you, uh, Bedford High? New Bedford High School, yep. Class of 1990. 90. Soccer player? Yep. I played soccer. I played the bench most of the time. I was the bench warmer, and I did really okay. well at that. But, uh, uh, yeah, I did. Uh, also, I was in the drama club. I was in show choir. I was in concert chorale. So I uh, always been involved uh, sort of like in the artistic way. As a matter of fact, to tell you the truth, uh, uh, after I graduated high school, I got a full ride scholarship to Anna Maria College up in, uh, in the Worcester area. Uh, full ride, paid paid out to go into music theater, and I did not go. Wow, interesting. Yeah. yeah. So I ask this question all the time. I know the answer to this already, but Cristiano Ronaldo or Messi? Uh, definitely CR7. Come well, on, man. Why? Because uh, why? he's, he's Portuguese, man. Come <laughs> no, on, man. besides that, I mean, he's, he's, I mean, he's a beast. I, I mean, mean it, you know, it goes like this, man. You know, I, I'm not taking anything away uh, from Messi. I think he's gay, but that's besides the point. Uh, but you know, uh, I just think Cristiano Ronaldo has, uh, uh, you know, so many records broken and the fact that Cristiano Ronaldo has played for several teams and, uh, Messi has only played for one team. I, I, could, uh, I could. And, and that's why I think stands Cristiano Ronaldo apart from Messi because he played in, uh, I believe in four different teams plus, Cristiano Ronaldo did win the European Cup with Portugal, and Messi has not won anything so, with, uh, with. I mean, uh, with regardless if, he, if he's gay or not, he's he's definitely. Nah, a talent. That, that was that was I, that I know was that's a joke. I know, because I, know. I really don't like the guy. Yeah, I don't but either. No, no, I, I think, don't either. <laughs> I, I think I think he's a really excellent, outstanding soccer player. Messi yeah. is just. Well, you make, you know, you know the, the, Messi is like one of those players that. He doesn't need to practice, you know. He, he's like he's just a great soccer player. He, he's just very gifted. Cristiano Ronaldo works on it every day. You know yeah. what I'm saying? And but the thing is, is you made a point. Uh, you know, Cristiano Ronaldo proved, proved himself in uh, La Liga, proved himself in the English league. Now he's in Italy. Yeah. So he's he's won, even he's in won, the Portuguese he, league, right? He's in the Portuguese league, and then it, it was Sporting, right? Starting yeah, out uh, yeah, with, with Sporting. sporting yeah. uh, you know, the one the, the team that kind of creates some of the best uh, players in the world. But uh, yeah. I, I won't say anything about that being Fika. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, anyways, man, back to. Um, to uh, back to your uh, so you went you 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 didn't uh, follow through with the um, going to school. What was the reason for that? Uh, I just um, you know I wanted uh, women and drugs at the time. You know I felt that that at that time of, of my life was more important to to be surrounded by you know by the devil I should say, and uh, I was just not in the in the right frame of mind to pursue a career in uh, in music theater. 
Do you ever, uh, uh, regret that decision? Uh, no, I don't regret it because eventually I found a, a, a different passion, which was a passion for the culinary arts. Yes, so, yes. when did that stop? Uh, so that started uh, basically when I was 23 years old. I it's actually a, a very interesting story. Um, so I was working for a few years now with my dad at a shipyard in Newport uh, called uh, Newport Offshore, and um, I didn't like what I did at all. Uh, and uh, you know, I just I didn't know what I wanted to do with my life. And uh, and then one day, a friend of mine approached me and asked me, "Hey, would you like to go? You got laid off." We always used to get laid off during the summer. You want to go to North Carolina, build the golf course from the ground up? And I said, I said, yeah, I, I think I would love to do that just to get away from the city. I had never gotten out from the city. This was all like all new to me, going down south. And I said, yeah, let's do it. So we hopped in the car. We drove to North Carolina. We ended up getting jobs at a golf course. We worked there for eight months when they... We had a routine where my friend did not know how to cook. I knew how to cook. So we had a routine that we, after a 12-hour day, we came in, uh, we came into our apartment. Uh, and basically, uh, I went to shower. He did the dishes from the night before because we never did the dishes from the night before because we were so tired. So I'd shower. He'd do the dishes. And then I'd come out, and I'd cook dinner. He'd eat shower. And I'd cook dinner pretty much at least three or four times a week. And then when the golf course was coming to an end, we were going to go back to New Bedford. And uh, and my friend asked me, he started questioning me. He's like, what are you going to do with your life now? What, are you going back to the shipyard? I know you don't like it. Uh, and I said, I don't know what I'm going to do. I guess I'm going to have to go back to the shipyard and and uh, and keep working because I can't just not work, you know. Uh, so he said, you know, you should really give it a try to culinary school. And I was like, you're crazy, man, going to culinary school, man. I'm not going to go to culinary school. And he's like, no, seriously. You should really just take the opportunity to try and apply to Johnson and Wales and go to culinary school because you really got a, a gift of talent of cooking. Every meal that I've had here that you have made, if it was simple, if it was intricate, it was just good. It was just good. You can tell that you have a really good passion for that. So I said, no, man, I'm not going to do that because, you know, I don't even know if I'll get accepted. It's kind of hard to get into that school. And I, I just, I'm not doing that. So... One day, we a few weeks later, we I, we came home, and uh, secretly, he uh, he got an application for me. So, uh, he I we came home, we had dinner just like the regular dinner we always used to have where I, where I would cook, and uh, and he's like, uh, Joe, I got um I got a surprise for you. And I said, Okay, Billy. <laughs> I said, What is that? He says, well, I got you an application for you to fill out for Johnson & Wales. And I was like, man, I'm not going to do that. He's like, just do it, man. Just do it for me. Even He's like, just do it for me. Just fill it out. I'll help you fill it out if you need help. And just send it out. And just see what happens. You know, you don't have to go. Just see what happens. And sure enough, I filled it out. I sent it in. And uh, I think a couple months later, I got accepted. And uh, what do you I went, think was in the uh, in the application that made them accept you? What? Uh, I'm not sure what the decision was, but in in all honest truth, I think was I think was God. Right I think God, I think God redirected me because you know God's got a plan for you, whatever you do in this Probably life. So I think it. was God trying to redirect me uh, to to do. Uh, something that I ended up finding out that I truly, truly loved. Mm -hmm. uh, so I ended up going to school. I went to Johnson & Wales, got my two years program, and uh, and uh, everything just started flourishing from there. What was your first job? My first cooking job was, uh, well, my first cooking job was at Friendly's Ice Cream. <laughs> that was my first, uh, actually, my first cooking job was at Kentucky Fried Chicken. But uh, I, when I was going to school, I was working at uh, Friendly's Ice Cream up in Pawtucket. And then a good friend of mine who was a chef moved up to Providence from Florida, and he got me a job at the Parkside Rotisserie and Bar, which is, I believe, still open in Providence. And mm -hmm. I went there and started working there, and that's when I really was like, wow, this is a different ball game. I really, really enjoy this, blah, blah, blah. So, you know, I started working at really nice restaurants. From From that restaurant, I went to... The Mediterraneo restaurant on on the hill that no longer exists now. Uh, I worked there for a little bit, and I kind of just 
bounced around a little bit in Providence. I worked at Cafe Nuovo. I worked at Capriccio's. I worked at the Atomic Grill, which was uh, huge back in the days. And uh, I was in Providence for a little while. And then while I was with my uh, with my ex-wife at the time, uh, we ended up moving to Connecticut um, uh, because she ended up going to Yale. And then I went with her, obviously, and then I ended up getting a job at the number one French restaurant in the, in the state of Connecticut, which was the Union League Cafe. And that's uh, where it all began. Nice. So I want to – we'll go back to all this because there's, there's a lot more uh, that you've accomplished throughout yeah. your career. But um, being Portuguese, we're yeah. all Portuguese here, right? Yep. Yeah. So – Portuguese has had such a huge influence throughout the world, right? Tempora, like, you know, throughout the world. But it's still very unknown. Even though it's upcoming, yeah. right? A lot of sh- chefs and, and even Gordon Ramsay's guys like that are just like, you know, Portuguese food is, is definitely, it's coming up. It's, it's something to, to look out for. But then you have like Spain and then, it, you know, Italy and, and their foods are more popular for some reason. What is it with, because we have great cheeses, we have great wines, we have great food. A lot of our food have been influenced throughout the world, Africa, uh, Asian, Asia, uh, you know, everywhere. What, what do you think? What, what, what's the deal, man? Uh, I mean, um, I think, uh, you know, obviously you start to see now a lot more Articles in magazines and chefs recognizing the uh, the uh, culinary of, of Portugal, because uh, you know our 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 culinary uh, you know our food is just it's so vast. There's so many different regions in Portugal that cooks uh, different dishes. They have different uh, backgrounds. Uh, you know, it, it's just it, it's beautiful. The thing is, it's I think it's because, you know, like Spain, for example. I'll give you a good example. Uh, Spain. Uh, Spain wasn't really in a map uh, until Ferran Adria, who started doing the molecular gastronomy, that finally came into the map. Uh, before that, you, you did hear about Spain. You did hear about chefs. But it wasn't. It was just like Portugal, you know. And I think Portugal hasn't done that uh, super breakthrough like Italy has, like France has, like Spain has, just because uh, there's there is great Michelin star chefs that are Portuguese, but they just haven't uh, elevated themselves to being world uh, top world chefs. And I'm not saying they're not world class; they are world class for sure, 100. percent But uh, they, I think, if you create a different method, uh, a, a different a different background, uh, just something new to introduce to the culinary world. I think until then, that's just my personal opinion, uh, Portugal will not be one of the grands like Spain and France is. Yeah, so you're like George Mendez, right, from uh, New York City. Yeah. He has Aldea, the yeah. Lupolos. Lupolos closed down. Yeah. He's a uh, you know a Michelin star too. I think I, I think it's one. Yeah, or whatever it is. Yeah, I, yeah. I've had at his restaurant. It was nice. It was had some Portuguese influence and, mm-hmm. and it pushed the Portuguese influence. Yeah, and he created different dishes. It was you know good food, all that stuff. But you know, it's honestly, it's not my style of fine dining. I like more of like a rustic Portuguese right. or, or ta- whatever the case is. Give me something that's rustic, rustic. not a little piece of yeah, you know, a moose on a on a thing that's supposed to be duck fat or something. I don't know. But right. my point is, I, I don't know, Portugal, just some reason, then you obviously have, you know, in our area, Portuguese restaurants in, in every block, right? And then we, there was a comment made uh, by um, some one who wrote an article in a magazine that the Portuguese food is blonde and very, they don't know how to cook a steak. It's very dry. And I'll come, I'm going to, <laughs> listen, I'm going to probably put my started. ass on the line. Don't even get me Most started. Most Portuguese restaurants around here can't cook a fucking steak. Yeah. And it's terrible. And they buy, you know, I understand they're buying the cheap little sirloin, the but even a, a cheap meat, piece of meat, yeah. you could still yeah. cook it decent. A lot if it's full of fat. Yeah. Like, well, I don't have so much, so many problems with, about not knowing how to cook a steak because, you know, as you know, uh, and I know that the problems that, that you're having, which is the problems I have, is that every time I order a medium rare or a medium steak, it comes out medium well. Right. Uh, yeah, exactly. And, you know, and I'm like, hey, what what the hell, man? This is this is already dead. Right. It doesn't need to be dead when it comes right. to me. But I, 
I, I think what the real, real problem about Portuguese restaurant, uh, restaurants are having is that there's not truly one Portuguese restaurant that you can say, now this is unique, this mm. is Portuguese, mm-hmm. these are recipes that come from different uh, aldeias, like uh, different uh, little villages that are brought here to the United States into this restaurant. And uh, because, you know, you go to a Portuguese restaurant, you see the the chicken Mozambique, the shrimp Mozambique, the the the, the, so the, the house crap, steak, yeah. the beef casa, you see the bacalhau. It's the, every single it's Portuguese the restaurant thing. has the same thing, same thing. And Portuguese cooking is just, it's completely different. Like, Yes, if you go to Portugal, you do see a house steak. That is a given. That's a traditional place. Yes, you do see a bacalhau. Absolutely. Yes, you see a, uh, a an octopus plate. But, man, there are so many great dishes out there in different regions of Portugal from the Azores, Madeira, Alentejo, from Porto, from Aveiro. Uh, just so many different dishes that that I can't say that there is one Portuguese restaurant around in the area that you can say, wow, I went there and this is super unique. And I, you know you know what? I'm just sick and tired of just seeing the old same stuff. Oh, we're going to have another Portuguese restaurant who's going to open. Great. They're right. going to have steak. going to have shrimp Mozambique. Right. It's going to have, you know, it's the same thing over and over and over again. So I'm waiting for somebody to come one day and just open something super Unique. Unique, yeah. And I think that's what the Portuguese culture needs in the restaurant, and not just in our area, because we're obviously, you know, we have the culture, but everywhere in the United States, get, in, you know, introduced. But if you introduce Portuguese food, other parts of this country, and they're cooking steaks the way they cook it, you know, we're going to get articles like that guy wrote about, you know, and I, I don't believe it. I think Portuguese food is very tasty and it depends what region you're from. It could be spicy, less spicy, more, you know, certain flavors and, 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 and how people like it. But I, I, I just, you know, pisses me off as a Portuguese person when I read certain things. It's like, man, Portuguese food is so good. There's so many things you can do. I mean, it's, it's so versatile, right? I just like not to get into this because we'll get into this later, but even like with the cooking and, and trying to cook healthier versions of it, I've cooked healthier versions of Portuguese food, right? You know, more of like a low carb or a keto, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. So, there's so many things you can do with it. You can, I, I think the you Portuguese can. just get, I mean, so, with everything, it's just bullshit. Like, I just feel like they're not recognized as much as they should, but yeah. I think also that overcooked steak that you can throw at the wall and, and it's going to freaking put a hole in it comes from a lot of the are people, the Portuguese, who also can't see blood on a plate. That is correct. Yeah. So, that Joe, if you're face-to-face with this critic and he wants a steak, what would you pour into that plate for him? And he wants a steak plate? A steak plate, yes. Well, if he, if he asked me for, first and foremost, if he asked for a medium rare, I'd make sure that it's cooked medium rare. Mm-hmm. And then the second, the second thing, which is uh, very ethical in cooking, is make sure it's perfectly seasoned the, you know it, 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 just like any other cooking technique any type of cuisine apply the right amount of seasoning and use the technique that needs to be used for that piece of product and it's and keep it simple keeping it simple what sides it, would bring out the the steak plate it, itself what would you put on that for them as as sides yeah I mean, you know, obviously, you have to put uh, French fries either with a salad or with some rice. How about with the egg? Oh, uh, of course, yes. egg and a and ham egg. slice. Yes, yeah. yeah, and and of course the Portuguese sauce. Everybody's got different versions of Portuguese st- uh, sauce. You know, one of them is thicker. Another one is a little bit more watery. One has got two pounds of garlic what, in it. The other so- one. What kind of sauce are you actually describing here? Uh, I'm talking about. <laughs> I'm talking about this Portuguese steak <laughs> sauce. Which one do you prefer? But we all do come in different like, flavors. Yeah, but you know, like, <laughs> know. like like if you go to the Academica and you have that that murdered pounded out <laughs> steak. Pounded out and, and, the I cube mean, cube I, steak with I, garlic. Oh, you I, had it pounded it. for days. Guys. I mean, <laughs> for days. From what I heard, from what I heard. Is that the the wooden board that they pound that meat? It's got broke it, down already. No, it's got like it's like a canoe now, it's like a, because uh, of, oh. of, of years of pounding in that thing. And I'm not believe me, I'm not taking them down because I've eaten steak at Academica and I actually liked it. I did. I enjoyed it. I, I, I liked I've, it. I'm not I, gonna lie, I enjoyed I, it too. I, I, it, was, it, was, it was good. It was good. But 
I mean, you know, the garlic that they put on, you, you, you there is the most powerful bat is not going to get next to you because they give you garlic. garlic. Oh, I, love garlic. I love garlic. It gives you a shitload of gas, though. Yeah. I, I learned that the hard way one time. I ate a shitload of garlic one time with a steak. I made it home all night. I was like, holy shit, what the fuck is going on? Yeah. And I, I actually Googled it, and it was garlic. Man. I had no <laughs> idea. So if you eat garlic, roasted garlic, a lot of it, like a ton of it, you're, yeah. you're, you're going to be hurting your digestive system. That's great like, to know. So, so let's go. I know you uh, worked in... Um, in a restaurant in Atlanta. Yeah. I, I want to dive into this restaurant business because I want to know the dirty, everything, dirty backdoor fucking secrets that happen in restaurants, uh, including the, obviously, the cooking, the stress that is involved with uh, with the restaurant business, the sex that I know that goes on with all the employees fucking each other, the drugs, the alcohol, uh, the after hours. I want to know everything, Joe. And I think you're the man that's going to be honest about it. So let's talk about Atlanta. Uh, tell us about that place you worked at. Uh, geez. Oh, man. I tell you, Elena was, um, it was great at the same time dangerous uh, because, um, <clears throat> uh, so I moved to Atlanta back in the year of 2000. That was my first time when I made my way into Atlanta uh, with my ex-wife. Um, and <clears throat> I worked in Atlanta in 2000 till 2003. <clears throat> and then I moved back up to Massachusetts and got married. And then in 2005, I got divorced and went right back to Atlanta. Uh, and, um, and basically what I can tell you about Atlanta is that Atlanta is, a, just a really awesome city. It really is an awesome city. Uh, there is, uh, some history, of course, Martin Luther King, uh, Civil War. Uh, so there's, as far as like historic things, there's, there is a lot of, uh, for the tourists, there is a lot of things for you to see, like the Georgia Aquarium, which is one of the biggest aquariums in the world. There's the Coca-Cola Museum, the Civil War Museum. There's Martin Luther King Memorial, but Atlanta is, uh, driven on nightlife that's what is driven on it's nightlife it's nightclubs at least it was before covid uh nightclubs lounges great restaurants a lot of drugs an extremely great amount of drugs lots of uh sex going on uh it's uh, it's a crazy city and i had to basically leave atlanta or I was probably going to die. Really? So you said and it, just, it was... I, and I, I'm, I'm not ashamed to say it uh, because when I lived in, in uh, Atlanta, I, you know, uh, there was uh, a lot going on for me. And uh, and uh, I had to leave because I knew it wasn't a good place for me if I continue living there. So you said it's a dangerous place to live. Was it because of the drugs and all the, yes. the partying? Yeah, yeah. The, all the partying, all the drugs. You know, you work in... In a restaurant business, you know, obviously you're working till 11 o'clock at night. You know, at the time when I, the first time when I lived out there, the, you know, the clubs were open till four or five o'clock in the morning. Of course, you're not going to go home, go to bed because you're all wound up from working all night doing 400, 500 covers a night. Mm. And, you know, and the next thing you want to do is just go home and wrap it up, especially at a young age. You know, right. you no, you want to, you want to go and party. You know, that's so I read I read the book uh, Restaurant Man by Bacciani, I don't know pronounce his name. Uh -huh. one, one of them's uh, Italy's and all that stuff. Uh -huh. And his book's pretty interesting. It breaks down the whole restaurant business, how, you know, his dad at the time didn't even want like certain things, linens because it was extra money and putting bread like the Portuguese places do, put they put bread or some restaurants put out bread that wasn't a no no because that's an ad expense. Yeah. And then he gets into the, the, the nitty gritty of things of where like in New York City anyways where they have restaurants, mm -hmm. uh, they talk about where they would do the lunch service from you know whatever it was 11 to 3 then it would shut down from 3 to 4 or 5 right, right. And then they would like people would sleep on on tables to get their rest and then they would start up and then he talked about all the drug use and, yeah. and, and people just doing drugs while working the sex that was going on between the employees and all that yeah that is all, that is that, that stuff is yeah. that just you know to sell books no. or did that shit does, does that really happen? It, it really really happens i mean i i, I mean i've seen it uh you know, I've seen line cooks doing cocaine right on a line while working. 
I've seen them do them inside the walk-in cooler, the freezer. I've seen, I've walked in uh, into a walk-in cooler and my general manager was banging a waitress. I had to shut the door behind me. It happens. You didn't want to and, join in? And, and <laughs> <laughs> it happens. High five. And, and <laughs> high five. Hey, I didn't see anything. <laughs> hey, how about a raise for me? Uh, but in any ways, yeah, you, I mean, especially in Atlanta, it, it happened. And I saw it just about in every restaurant I worked. You know, it happened. And, that, and that's uh, how you kind of like get in with your line cooks, you know. And at the time, even in Atlanta, when I first started, I wasn't even, uh, uh, I didn't even have a position, you know. I was either a line cook or I was a, a kitchen manager, but, you know, I didn't have a position. So I was partying with all those guys, you know, and, uh, you know, and that shit just got old, you know. After a, a seven years, seven, eight years of doing that, it just got old, and I just had to walk away from so it. So it's pretty much, a, I, uh, I would say maybe, I mean, I'm sure there's older guys that still do it, but it's probably a phase when you're younger, get into that industry. Yeah, uh, I think, uh, well, it's a phase when you're younger, uh, a lot younger, because when you're younger, you're invincible, you know. You, you can, you know, I, I remember, you know, partying all night and, and uh, not even going to bed and just maybe resting for an hour or two and and going right back to work. And at the end of my shift, what did I do? Again, let's go party, you know. It, it's just, it was continuously like that weekend after weekend after weekend what about during after the week? weekend. Uh, yes, during the week it happened. Sometimes it didn't happen. Mostly it was on the weekend yeah. Uh, when everything happened, and uh, you know, I you know I I remember when I used to get paid on a Friday, and by Sunday I'd have twenty dollars in my pocket, and then I'd be asking for money for this one and that one to just get me through the week until I got paid, I got paid again, and um, and uh, most of those people they lived and still live like that in a restaurant business. I don't I don't really know what it's like now. In a restaurant business, but I, nothing. I'm very sure that nothing has changed. I'm sure there's still d- drugs going on. I know there's still sex go- going yeah. on. There's, uh, I think definitely in the bigger cities like New York yeah. City, Chicago, uh, <laughs> even in cities. the small cities, could you, be. Yeah, yeah I mean, you, I, I, I agree. I think front of there's no. I didn't listen. I don't want to make it sound. There's probably some guy out there, his his girlfriend or his wife is a, a waitress front of the house, and they think he's banging the, the cook in the back. I'm not saying that happens. It everywhere, could be a possibility, but there is a possibility that the front yeah. of the house is banging the back of the house and vice versa. And yeah. yeah, definitely. I mean, I totally get it. I remember one one of one of the books I read. Uh, there was a, a woman. And it's crazy because I want to talk about this, you know, this thing about uh, celebrity chefs and how that's come about the last few years, which is it's been pretty crazy. Um, and everybody wants to be a chef for those purposes, not the right purposes, right? Because right. I think it's just really right. easy and yeah. all that. But I read uh, uh, in a book that um, this there was a couple, there was a group of people eating, right? <laughs> so they were eating at. A, I was actually, I'm sorry, there's an article in a magazine I, I, I read, and there was a group of people eating who wanted to talk to the chef. And the chef came out, and it was a guy and his wife and their friends. And they asked the chef, like, you cooked this meal personally? He says, yeah. He goes, well, if you could, if you cooked this meal, it was so damn good that it would be an honor if you'd fuck my wife. That is the honest. This was in a magazine. I'm not making this up. This is no bullshit. I was like, are you kidding me? Well, this is a chef. Different strokes I don't know. for different I, folks. I don't know if you read uh, Kitchen Confidential. Uh, with uh, uh, with Anthony, yeah, Bourdain. I actually have his picture over there. Oh, a nice yeah. poster. I wish so, I had up, but, uh, yeah. so you know, in the beginning of his book, of his beginning of experiences when he worked in Cape Cod, he states right on there that his first restaurant that he worked in Cape Cod on a weekend there was a wedding at a, at the restaurant where he worked, and that uh, in the middle of the reception of the wedding inside the restaurant that he was working, he found a chef out in the back with the bride. Over a fifty-five gallon drum, and he was fucking her. Over the bride, that's that's, yeah. that's insane. On our wedding night, she just got married. Yeah. <laughs> so you know, the, the, in in uh, in my profession, that the, you know that happens, and uh, you just have you just have to make put it on speaker. Answer the phone. What's okay? No. <laughs> uh, and I, you know, you just you have to make your own decisions. You know. Uh, to if you're going to be following the devil or if you're going to do the right thing, yeah, you know, yeah. because it, it, it can it can grab you, it can grab you by the balls 
uh, in this business if you don't don't take a hold of yourself well, because you can easily just be an addict. Maybe that bride, like, you know, when you go to a restaurant, the joke about you don't have money, so go wash dishes. Maybe they didn't have the money to flip the bill, so she went bang a chef. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. Uh, so let's talk about. Maybe she had the beer goggles on. She thought it was her husband. <laughs> Come here, honey. At that point, hey, like you said, you know, people are f- freaks out there. Maybe that's what they wanted. Maybe they know. said, I want to bring a chef on your wedding. Anyway. You know, or her husband went to a bachelor party and kind of did I his actually, thing. I uh, actually and- owned a business in 08, the On the Rocks Lounge. It was the worst mistake I ever did trying to open up a restaurant business without any experience. Yeah, it was a lot of people. A lot of people, a a show, lot of people do that, and they, and they fail miserably. I did. I failed miserably. One hundred and thirty. Yeah. Wow, my life savings. At the he talks about that in the first episode. Wow, one hundred thirty grand. He lost a lot. And the yeah. work and the time. That but I he spent can't there. just blame himself. He had a partner too, right? So yeah. Just, if I take full accounting for my actions, they do. No, no, they, I know. But you can't just I'll say. I'll never hey, bring them up because. Right, right, and, and you're and you're doing the right thing not to. Yeah. But yeah. you can't just sit there, look in the mirror, and unless say, it was face to face. It was just me, Here's unless. Sunday. Unless you were the complete fuck up, then then take off full responsibility. But at the end of the day, it just wasn't you, bro. So don't let that. No, I'm just talking shoulders, like you know? about how crazy that life is, and yeah. all the like most of the waitresses too are like single moms, man. It's like yeah, I won't know? get I, w- I won't get into that life and and, and restaurants and, and shit that really happens. Yeah, because uh, rest- I think somebody the- I think. You know, you can relate and somebody else can relate to exactly what happens in that business with... Just the amounts of alcohol people consume and the money they spend. It's like, you have to see it to believe it, really. Yeah, no, absolutely. Yeah, well, and then think when, about think about when we used to, you know you go and, and you're spending a, a ton of money and give me this give me that buying rounds like it was the same thing you work all week and then you're fucking spending it all on a weekend like as a, as a kid you know yeah, yeah but then you have you have adults who never grow up and they still do it even when they're in their forties and like I had one dude he came by the place one time he was selling Christmas trees he had his fanny pack full of cash right. Mm-hmm. By the end of the night, all that cash was gone. Oh yeah, it was in my cash. I, yeah, stuff. I mean a lot. A lot it's of like, the, dude, uh, you just spent all night in the cold selling Christmas trees, bro, and you just spent everything. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, 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 and Heineken and uh, I still remember was um, Sequim Seven. Heineken and Sequim Seven. Yeah. Boom, boom, boom. It's like yo. Yeah, I mean, it, like I said, you got to vibrate it, on that phone, it, there, uh, my man. Yeah, I do. Uh, <laughs> and uh, it, it happens. <laughs> <laughs> What would you like? Favorite restaurant, Portuguese restaurant in this area? What would you like if you were going to recommend some some place to somebody? What would you, what would uh, you do? not to call and you know call anybody out, but just what would you prefer in this area? Listen, I I don't know because there's uh, I wish I remember the damn name. There's one in New Jersey that's really no. cool. I know I know you're saying local, yeah. but it's it's no. We want to hear local. We don't want to hear fucking New Jersey shit, yeah, man. Fuck that. Yeah, it's, we're all about New England over here. But yeah. I, but if you want unique, like you said, I'm I'm going to drop some names. That's very unique around here. I don't know. I mean, I like uh, uh, Alianza puts good food. I go to Cafe Europa often for lunch. Um, it's actually the food's been pretty good there. Um, uh, top shelf. I, I I frequent there a lot. He's but he's Portuguese American. Cafe Mimo. I like. Have there. you been to David's? David, I have been to David's. I once. I um, I brought my my kids there, but probably. A little, Prior to COVID, did right he have? COVID. Uh, did he have? Uh, did he have? Uh, shrimp Mozambique and chicken Mozambique. That's what my son and, always. Oh, he's actually, my, my son eats. Have you ever been, Joe? I have been. Have I you have seen been. the menu? It's 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 not like the traditional yeah, menu, it's just, right? It's There's just like, different dishes in there. It's just like top shelf. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That's I, I noticed too. Yeah. Yeah. Copycat, different but, spin. I don't know. You said it. Not I, me. I don't know. But I, I don't want to be the bad guy. <laughs> but um. But he's a roasted he's pig a, is pretty he's a, good he's, too. Roasted yeah. pig does a good job with their fish. I, I get a lot of this. So my fa- I, I, I tell you, I, I I have a few favorites, but I got to tell you that one, uh, probably my favorite Portuguese restaurant uh, is Novo Mundo. Novo Mundo. Oh yeah, I Novo, you can't write. Novo Mundo is. It's like is, that that hole in the wall. Come like, on, man. Rust, yeah, yeah. It's Novo just, Mundo's definitely. It's just, uh, the, and, and I'm not just talking about the the chicken, like, but like the ribs. The, even the Portuguese steak is so good, and well, I, uh, uh, I mean, she has like the the tuna, the, the Azorean tuna that she has is great. The uh, the dubrada is excellent. You don't think there's dubrada. a lot of garlic in her food because every dish no. I've gotten, yet, no, oh my, leave out of there with a headache. I no, love garlic, though. not at all. I so had what? The, that's, that's the problem. But, what? <laughs> they, the garlic ain't the problem. I mean, I ate the garlic it's, shrimp. I, I went over there today, so... had the garlic shrimp, and it didn't have maybe. 
two or three pieces of garlic in there. Dude, I asked for well, maybe they I love garlic. Or I love garlic. Put yeah. throw on the garlic. But, but Novo Mundo too. to me is uh, you know one of my top ones. I like Top Shelf a lot. I do like. Uh, uh, Antonio's. I like uh, uh, I Restaurant too. Algarve. It's pretty good. Well, Antonio's, we used to go there a lot on a Saturday. to have the uh, link down, which is the small pig. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, real, the bomb with the shrimp and stuff like that. Yeah, they're the very consistent, stuff. too. I mean, at the end of the day, you do have good food around here, but... Uh, you know, traveling in other places. I've I've gone to a few other places. And actually, there's a place in, and I think it's Warren. I went not too long ago and actually posted it. And a lot of people have gone since. Uh, and I can't, Water Dog Cafe. I think it's, yeah, the Water Dog Cafe. That place, it's, it's, it's Portuguese mm-hmm. influenced. So it's right. kind of like, if you haven't gone, try it out. Yeah. So it's like, it's got Portuguese influence, but it like, it, it, it does it like With contemporary, contemporary modern Portuguese where it's not, I mean, say you're going to get, um, I don't know, whatever, you know, Shrimpo's a beak, but it's not Shrimpo's a beak. It's like a nice twist to it. It's like, it's really good stuff. So I, I really enjoyed that. That restaurant's pretty good. That's And it's a nice atmosphere. It's a cool looking place. Yeah, I like Warren. It's a nice area. Yeah, I'll have, to, I'll have to try it out. Warren has a lot of nice. Uh, yeah, they do. Nice They're hidden gems they also. They yeah. do have, uh, they do have a lot of, actually one of, one of my top favorite restaurants in this area, not Portuguese. Uh, the food is just phenomenal and the chef is amazing. Uh, if you've never been there, please go. It's called Medicom. I was also in the time Medicom. Yeah, Medicom. It's still there. I thought they yeah. shut down. Are no, they, they're, they, still they're still there. They're still there. They're still there. Yeah, I've been to Medicom. There's a, a few lot times. of good. There's a lot of fantastic restaurants in the area, especially in the Providence area. Um, uh, one of my favorites uh, is Persimmons. Persimmons is just Persimmons is outstanding. The, the outstanding, one that closed. Outstanding. Uh, what was the name of it? The North. Uh, so the, the north. north was really good when they used to be in their old location, which again it was kind of. Reminds, I, they haven't been to their new location. They're gone. They're gone. They're gone. They're they're gone. They went to the hotel, uh, pra, whatever they, they they went. I forget the hotel. They moved uh-huh. into there. Yeah. And sometimes that's what happens. They have such a unique place. I know it's small, but it, it was, was like you, the, so unique. It was though. so unique. Yeah. Emerald Lagasse. There's a picture of Emerald Lagasse dining there with some people. Yeah. And it was like a unique place. It was Asian fusion. So you went in there, and it was just like a great yeah. experience. And they, when they moved to the new location, it was just like any other restaurants, like fancy, whatever the case yeah. is. This it other didn't place, work for them. It didn't. Yeah. And they, they ended up closing out. And then across yeah. the street, I know it's kind of like in a weird neighborhood. It's like a residential neighborhood. And then you'd be put on the waiting list. And then across the street, you could go have a drink at the speakeasy. Yes, exactly. Yeah. And so it would be yeah. completely dark in there. Like yeah. the speakeasy. It's like, it was like the coolest completely, experience. Yeah, it was, it but, was, very, yeah, it was but very, they're, very they're, good. they're completely gone. So their food was pretty good. I had good some of the me. best meals at, at, at North. I actually was the one who discovered it and ended up telling uh, some of my friends around. And then they started going. They started telling other people. But I was like one of the first ones who discovered that place because it was given to me by – uh, a really good chef friend of mine who was uh, who went to culinary school with me, uh, and he's uh, now the chef at Troop, which is also mm-hmm. excellent uh, over in uh, in Providence. But there's there's a lot of great restaurants in this area. There there really is. People just uh, you know this whole COVID thing that uh, you know, and I, and I want, I really want to talk about this today is that. Uh, the government really fucked us. Oh, restaurant business. Uh, like they really, on, they really fucked the restaurant business. They did, uh, and uh, they were the scapegoats. So I, I understand that there should be guidelines, there should be rules and regulations, and I, I abide by them all. Uh, but when it came to grants, when when it came for uh, relieving the, you know, the restaurant business for for families who were struggling on an everyday basis uh, for, from dishwashers all the way down to general managers and, and owners, you know, the government just said, fuck you. Yeah, we don't, we don't care definitely. about, about you. So, so th- when- uh, and, and it was really fucking shitty that they did that because I tell you what, uh, there's a lot of people who are very fucking discouraged about what the government did uh, to the restaurant business. And a lot of, I know sh- personal chefs of mine who are very extremely ten- talented who are either pursuing other professions like construction and other things, and some of them are just doing private chefing. Uh, and and it's, uh, it's sad to see that because, uh, uh, you know, we are the type of profession that makes people happy. Mm. Not only that, Joe, you we know? need that in our culture. What's that? We need that in our cu- culture. Yeah, we we need it. That's like, what we do. We like, go out like, we're what, friends. What, we what, sit what down. Are people, we what, eat. Are, what are people like? Like, 
we are. What do people do for enjoyment? Yes, they, you know, whatever. Try different could, restaurants. You know, could be drinking, could be sex, could be whatever it is. But people have a, a great enjoyment of just going out dining to a restaurant. You know, it, it, and not only that, the experience of going to different places. And exactly, this place. exactly, and and for them to to treat. Uh, uh, the restaurant business the way they did, I think they they could have been a little bit more compassionate and say, this is what we're going to do for the restaurant business. Uh, But no, uh, they totally put that aside. And and, uh, and it's sad because a lot of great restaurants closed down and 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 restaurants keep closing down. How about this job? Because because the 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 government didn't uh, didn't have a plan. It comes down to this though. Tell me if you agree or not. Let people make their own decisions. If they want to go out and have a bite to eat with restrictions, like you said, in guidelines. I bullshit on the restrictions. So I'm just saying, why can't I, why can't we just choose? I, right. Let's go eat. Here, this is when I, I stopped giving a shit about restrictions. Like, I'll respect that we had this conversation before. I need to wear a mask. I'll wear a mask in your restaurant. I need to wear a mask to go through your restaurant to sit down and take it off. I'll do that. I have to but go that's to the store. That's easy for you to say, that. Jamie, when they tell you you can't work anymore. But hold on. So let's get political right now. So after this is all said and done, they said about 40% of restaurants nationwide will be closed. They gave yeah. billion-dollar bailouts to the cruise industry, the airline industries, and all that. So this is what my point is about these restrictions, which I think is a bunch of bullshit. So you get on a plane today. Everybody's still packed in there like sardines. But you go in a restaurant, and you're telling these guys, oh, you can only be at fucking 50, uh, 50% capacity. Or oh, you have to be six feet fucking apart still. That's bullshit. When you get on a plane, for the airlines that you bailed out, right, there's, there's no social distancing. I traveled not too long ago. I was on a plane with hardly any people. Oh, make sure you're social distance. Don't get up all at the same time. And, and then my next the flight, plane. the next fucking flight I was on, it was completely packed. Everybody gets up. There was no concern about social distancing. So yeah. the restaurant industry got fucked in that manner. And now these, these, the airline industry, the cruise industry, people are flying again. People are booking flights and they're packed and they're gouging people. The flights are not fucking cheap anymore. What happened to that money? Are they paying it back to the government? Oh, because no. they're they going to make their money. They, exactly. So the restrictions <laughs> they put on restaurants, I think, is a bunch of bullshit. They shouldn't. They do that. I mean, six feet apart, fifty percent capacity, and and I'm just talking about this state because this is what when yeah. I know. I know other states don't give a shit. Like Florida, the governor's like, I mean, hey, I, we're back to normal, it, but it's bullshit. Yeah. These restrictions. I mean, I Everything you know, it, it, this is such a sensitive topic that we. We could sit here for the next uh, uh, year talking about this, and uh, and but like you said, it's there's a lot of bullshit uh, that's going on, and uh, if we're gonna make it right, make it right for everybody, regardless if you're a top dog or if you're or just franchise, a, or if you're a franchise, you got, you or, I mean, like or Kentucky Fried Chicken, McDonald's, a mom and pops, Burger King, they, they all stood open. Pops. They all stood open. <clears throat> well, the yeah. fast food was the the convenient thing, but on the flip side of that, Joe. Mm-hmm. And, and tell me if this is the truth or not. And I have friends in the industry uh, that own restaurants or managers or whatever the case. On the flip side of that, they're having a hard time filling positions too because some people don't want to go back to work. They make more Because now yeah. they're taking advantage of this COVID relief. <clears throat> they're yeah. laid off. and they're, they're, So yeah. on the flip side of it, restaurants struggled. And now that they're able to make some money and gain some of that 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 traction back that they lost the last couple of years, they can't find fucking people to work. Yeah, right. because the government are paying them to stay home. That's 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 what. So are you seeing is. that in the industry? Oh yeah, I, I, I uh, yeah, I see it every day. I mean, there, we went from, we went from, that's okay if that line cook wants to leave, that's fine, it, it, no big deal, and uh, I'll I'll hire ten tomorrow, and today it's like, no, don't let that cook leave because uh, you're not gonna get any help coming in the door. I, I mean, even in Boston, where where I'm at, like you, uh, literally, you see people coming through the door, but people with no experience, and those are the people that you have to take, which I'm okay with because those are the type of people that actually work out the best because they have no, no, no bad things that they've no, learned from a yeah, you can mold no, them. yeah. So you kind of mold them and you coach you coach them and develop them into what you want them to be. Uh, but those are the kinds that before it was, you know. People that have experience will walk through the door. Now it's people who don't have experience. So be, why? Because, you know, they're sitting at home. 
that have been uh, laid off, furloughed, or whatever you call it, and they at home collecting all this money, and uh, and and they're okay with it. They don't need to go to work. And not nothing for nothing though. The restaurant business too it ain't really popping yet because how, like, if these waitresses are you know used to getting so many tables per night, but with the restrictions on capacity now, maybe that money ain't the same. I. So yeah. they sit home, yeah. And I collect. I I agree with that a little bit, but there's some a, restaurants that are yeah. still jamming, and the, yeah, the outdoor seating, yeah. Yeah. they're jamming. Yeah. So as, I think as the, the weather gets better, it's during be during COVID a year ago when yeah. things were shut no, down, yeah, they no, were hurting. That was, that was the worst. No, people, Once everything things started, is, every, everything is. So you notice so, more people so, going out. Well, with stuff? well, it is the deal. The and you got to remember this. A lot of these restaurants before uh, COVID happened, uh, a lot of these restaurants, they did dine-in mm-hmm. and they did takeout. Yep. They didn't do delivery. So now they got an, an extra uh, an, an extra income coming in because now they do dine-in. They do uh, – you come in for takeout and they also do delivery. And a lot of these restaurants in Boston, that's where they're capitalizing on is that a lot of the restaurants in Boston who never did delivery – and they're going to keep on doing delivery, and they see in their return uh, coming back, which to me is unbelievable and so great to hear because that's going to make up for all the money that they lost mm-hmm. and hopefully you know, bring all the cooks back that were furloughed and be able to build their teams up and get their lives back to normal. And that to me is the most beautiful thing. I just met you today, Joe, I'm, and I'm, I have to ask you this question before I forget. Like, Why don't you own your own place? Man? You seem like you have a personality. The knowledge, uh, just the, uh, the love of food and everything else, and people. It's uh, it's one of those things that uh, that I rather not do because it's a lot of headaches, and plus I don't want to be one hundred thirty thousand dollars down a hole. <laughs> I know experience though. Yeah. It's what you put it's on a, the plate. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, listen, it's what you listen, put on the plate. Listen, yeah. uh, you know, regardless, I had a hot time. You know, regardless, uh, what name you have. Uh, what experience you have and how good you are and all that. No, please know that some of the most famous chefs have shut down their own oh, yeah. restaurants, you know. Well, so, George, George Mendes that I talked George about. George Mendes. L- Lupolo shut down. George, I, mean, I don't know if Aldea the still list, open, The list goes on and on of amazing bunch, chefs, you know? of amazing, even mi- three Michelin star chefs who've closed the restaurants down. And, and it's a proven fact, it, st- statistically, it's a proven fact that eighty percent of the restaurants within three years they close. Yeah, I know. I know they that's close. That for so sure. that's that. Why would I want to? You years. know, I why would I want to open my own restaurant? I mean, I'm comfortable with having my job and you know doing a little bit of work on the side and and all that good stuff. So it was never a dream of yours. Uh, it was when I was younger. Oh, okay. When I was younger, yeah, that was. Of course, everybody's dream when you when you are a young chef, everybody's dream is to have your own restaurant, you know. So, uh, yeah, I've had that dream before, but today I'm a little bit wiser and uh, I choose not to. Well, good to know. Yeah, yeah. Sometimes owning a business, I know I wouldn't get that. I wouldn't take that business on if someone handed it to me. I just want to do it. It consumes too much of your life, and at the end of the day. You're only here on this earth for a short time. Well, so. especially if you have another job and then you you, you check it. You know what I mean? It's just that's, that's those two years were a blur. Yeah, because yeah. I work construction. Yeah, and yeah. I. Yeah, yeah. Dude, when you're when crazy. you're when you're in the restaurant business, the the years just go by so fast. It just it just flies. But at the same time, I mean, restaurants that are successful do make money. So yeah, oh, yeah, definitely. Yeah, no, definitely. That's why I give. That's definitely. why I felt so bad for them. Definitely, this whole pandemic thing because. Yeah. People who make it in that business are like legit hot. The hottest work is around, man, because yeah. it's so hard. Yeah, it's, mentally it, you know, and it's, physically. It, 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 and it's crazy because, you know, uh, and this is one of the things I also wanted to talk about is that, you know, a lot of people don't realize uh, how hard and how, how hard that oh we God. chefs work. Unbelievable. Uh, uh, because, it, and I give, I, I give, this a little bit of fault to TV because TV glorifies chefs mm-hmm. on on TV uh, because uh, you know the, it, people see it and they're like oh it's great to be a chef you know it's so it, it must be easy for them because they're so used to it blah, blah blah but they don't know what goes behind the scenes you know what I'm saying and and it, what upsets me the most is that 
A lot of these kids who are going to culinary school, they don't even they don't even want to be chefs. No, have they just want to be famous. Yeah. Have a you know, they right just want to be have the opportunity to possibly one day be on TV and be a famous chef because they think it's cool, it's trendy. But I, I, I guarantee you that more than 25% or 30 or 40% of the people who go to culinary school today, they want to do it because it's trendy, it's cool, mm. and they have a possibility so of being when, uh, famous. When we hired our first cook, Joe, he was from college, he was from that school, Joe, in Wales. He, great interview, seemed motivated. Two weeks after being the head chef, we gave him full rings. You bring your creativity. Bring it. Put it on the menu. We support you no matter what. Because he, he did cook pretty good. Two weeks into the job, I hear him. I'm, I'm washing dishes, helping out the, the dishwasher. I hear in the background, oh, another slip from my head chef. I turn around <laughs> and I said, another slip? You should be thankful there's that people is, yeah. coming here to yeah. eat your food, dude. Yeah. I knew I was in trouble right there. Yeah, I knew yeah. it. I knew it. I, I knew it. My, yeah. hat, my heart just sank to my ass, dude. I was like, wow, yeah. another yeah. slip, bro. It's, it's fucking, like, it's that, 8 it's, o'clock at night and you're complaining about and, slips, and, dude? And that, and that's I've been sheet rocking and, all day and, and, and I'm over here washing dishes. And and, you're going to complain about a slip? Yeah, and that's where I refer to. I feel like grabbing to, my soul. And that's where I refer to that a lot of these kids are going to all culinary talk. school because they probably can't figure out what the fuck they want to do for the rest of their lives. And, they, and because being a chef is trendy and it's cool... And they think that being a chef is going to be their thing. But then when they get, because when you're at school, it's cool. You party, you go to keg parties, you're smoking weed in your in your room, you know, and you're cooking your, in your classes and all that. But when you get thrown in the fire, yeah. that's a whole, whole that's what different ballgame. That's what I was, that's what I was talking about completely, before. Completely, completely different. It's like... It's like night and day. They don't understand what goes on in the kitchen until you get thrown in the fire. When you get thrown in the fire then you and you see what it's like. Give me an example they, like a crazy night where you cook like Oh my god. I will give I'll give you a, the most like I'll give you a insane I'll, number of people. Okay, then, I'll give like, you a, I'll give you an example. And you remember just being like you're gonna fan the other I'm no, I'm just gonna give you a scenario. Uh but a true one, right? Uh, uh yeah, a, a true one. I'm gonna give you a scenario. So this restaurant, uh Atlanta uh, 500, 550 covers on a Saturday night. Uh, dining room is dining room is packed. Tickets just keep coming in. Uh, we're backed up on the line. The tickets are just falling on the ground wow. and it's rolling on the ground. And uh, as we are putting food out, a uh, huge uh, party of twenty co- uh, comes out out of the ticket. The first ticket with all mo- modifications. You have to modify everything. <laughs> Then they, then you got a couple. Then you got another table of fifteen. They got a bunch of modifications. Now this guy cut himself. He's got to go home because he split his finger almost to the bone. He can't work. <laughs> now the dishwasher's got to go got into diet. doing salads because he learned salads a couple of days ago. He knows how to do a few things. And there's a guy who's going to direct him how to do salads because he's working also the salad because you need two, three people to do the salad station. And the guy from the salad station who's worked on the grill maybe three or four times got to go over to the grill. Now he's over <laughs> to the grill working with another guy, but he's burning all the fucking steaks. And all the steaks are going out. And instead of being <laughs> medium rare, they're, they're all going fucking going. well done. And all that table of 20 comes back oh. because all those steaks and all that food is overcooked and See? people are fucking pissed. No one yeah. thinks about that shit, though. Yeah, you want to be a cook? No one thinks about you wanna that. You want to be a chef, huh? Nobody yeah, it's so great. That. Yeah, it's I it's know. not it's not it's so great. great. I, I mean, I love to cook at home, and a lot of people say that all the time. Oh, won't you open? Listen, man, there's a big difference of yeah. cooking at home and my comfort. That, yeah. to me, is therapy. Yeah. Going to a restaurant and dealing with that shit is not therapy. Especially every yeah. customer is like, every feel day, like they're Every um, day, day in out. They're I'm a good. critic. Yeah. I, I, I get a lot of respect for, for chefs. But that goes back to what I was talking about, celebrity chefs and how they're so glorified now. A lot of kids think they're going to you know, go into the culinary and become you know, Bobby Flay or they're going to be on the Food Network. And this leads into... This guy who is somewhat of a celebrity <laughs> chef. Yeah, TV, <laughs> I don't, I, I'm not a celebrity no. chef. But you are. I, listen, I'm, I'm you're excited pretty, to talk about this. I, I, I'll kid this aside. You're pretty well known. By no way or means I'm a celebrity no, chef. I know, no, I know. I'm, I'm, I'm a chef. I'm a passionate chef. I love what I do. But locally. I was just, I was just, uh, I was just really blessed by God that, uh, that he blessed me 
to be able to compete in a couple of shows on Food no, Network. No, no. Before you get to that, Joe, don't don't discredit yourself because locally you are a celebrity I, I'm, chef. I'm, I, so you can say what you want. I know yeah. you're being humble right now, but locally no. you're, you're, you're a celebrity chef, which, you know, I think, one, because you're popular, you know a lot of people, and then two things that happened in, in your in your career that you actually joined, and I want to know the real, you know, everything about it. But, you, you know, you're a... a Fed new, a Food Network top champion and uh, Cutthroat Kitchen. Cutthroat Kitchen, yeah. So I, Chop was first. I was there at your um, at your um, screening party when, yep. when you won it. So no, that was Cutthroat Kitchen. Cutthroat Kitchen, I'm yeah. sorry. Yeah, it was because it tied up. With yeah, because uh, Chop was, uh, Chop, was, was yeah. aired in 2013. That is correct. So it was, it was I mean, I put, yeah, you're right. So let's talk about Chop first. How did that, that come about? How did, how did you get on that uh, So I was, I was working in Atlanta for this little re- restaurant group. We had three restaurants and the PR company sent out an email to the three chefs from the three different restaurants saying that Food Network was going to be in Atlanta inside of a hotel and they were going to be conducting interviews to get onto the show Chopped. Um, and I signed up for it. Uh, I was like, I got nothing to lose. I'll just go and interview and and whatever. If it happens, it happens. If it doesn't happen, it doesn't happen. Whatever. So, you know, uh, all the PR companies in Atlanta, they all got the same email. They all distributed to all the restaurants in Atlanta. So I think, uh, I believe was over 200 interviews or possibly even more. And only 11 of us made it. Uh, so, uh, you know, I was going through a tough period of my time during the time I was going through a, a bad breakup with, uh, with the mother, uh, with the uh, mother of my child, and uh, which we're, we're good friends now, but uh, I was going through a rough period of time, um, and um, and I needed something to lift me up. And uh, I think once again was a God who uh, who blessed me with uh, uh, being uh, uh, being on that show. I was actually I was really down. I was on the highway. Uh, my car had run out of gas. Uh, I was frustrated because I had to go to work and ran out of gas in the highway, in a very busy highway in Atlanta. I don't know if you ever been to Atlanta, but it's like uh, eight lanes, and that's where mm-hmm. I was with no gas. And I was just like, oh, my God, this is how the day is going to go. And all of a sudden, I get uh, a bling on my phone, and I go and check. I checked. It was an email. I go and check. It was Food Network. And I was like, I opened it up. It was like, uh, congratulations, Chef Joe Rigo. You have been accepted to be on the show, Chop. And uh, and uh, I uh, ended up going. Now, when when I went, we met at a Starbucks right across from the studio at the Meatpacking District, uh, which is still there. Mm-hmm. And came to find out uh, that uh, when I walked into the cafe, I was going to competing against two other of my friends that I didn't know about who were also from Atlanta. One of them was Ludacris, a uh, personal chef. Oh, wow. Uh, and the other one was a good friend of mine who had a restaurant in Atlanta and then a girl from Vegas. Um, and, you know, we just we went at it at each other. You know, I felt blessed that I was at uh, in there filming and I knew it was already going to look great on my resume but I hadn't obviously I wanted to win I'm not going to say that I wanted to win but did I think I was going to win uh, no I didn't think I was going to win but I just felt blessed to be in being there and the cards uh, ran you know they ran on my side and I ended up uh, pulling away and won what's the behind the scenes like uh, on a show like that is it like scripted kind of or uh it's not really scripted um it's not really scripted it, it is the way it is you go into a room they do they do the thing uh they do the thing the you know to choose who's going to go to the next round all that they have to uh clean your station reset your station up and all that stuff so it takes about an hour or so in between sets to go and get started again. So basically, I walked into the studio about 6.30 in the morning. I didn't leave there until about 9 o'clock at night. How many days a week? Wow. It was just, just one day. Just the one show. Oh, one, one day. day. One day. day. Yeah. They, they accomplished everything in one day? They accomplished everything in one day. Yeah. Wow, no so 
the when they uh, they give you uh, what you have to cook, do they give you an idea what you're cooking, or no, it's, it's really they, just uh, like you got to. No, they they pull it out of you your have head. you have no idea what's in the basket. Uh, it just is like like it is. The minutes is the way it's as it is, and uh, <clears throat> and basically. The only thing that they let you do is take uh, a five-minute uh, trip through the kitchen so you can see the equipment. And that's the only thing that they let you do. And then it's it's balls to the wall after that. What do you think set you apart from the rest of the contenders that made you come on first place in that? Uh, I just think that my dishes were, were better. I just think I executed them better. Um, uh, I just think that I put a lot of uh, different twists into my dishes, and I think that's what set me apart from everyone else. Nice. So then, after uh, Chop, you, um, you, how, how did you did you apply? How did um, Cutthroat Kitchen come out, come come along? The what? The Cutthroat Kitchen? Yeah. How did I, that come after uh, Chop? Uh, so. I was living here in Massachusetts. Uh, I was working uh, at Notch Average Joe's up in Randolph, and I actually applied for that one. Did you? Yeah, I applied for that one, and they called me up, and uh, I did a Skype interview with them, and they picked me to go too. So I went. Uh, I went uh, and competed in L.A., and... Um, and ended up coming on top again. Uh, so, uh, did I, you bring I, any lessons from the first competition to this one? Yes, yes, uh, I did. And uh, I think what set me apart from winning the second show was the fact uh, that I already had done that and knew the pressure of it. Uh, and uh, I think that worked towards my advantage. Oh hell yeah! Yeah. yeah. Nice. Yeah, so before we uh, wrap this up, because we're actually over uh, an hour right now. Yeah. But, so before we wrap this up, where what what are you up to nowadays? Where am I? What? What are you up to nowadays? What are, what are you doing? Uh, so right now I'm just working at a Tate Bakery over in Boston, and uh, I've actually started a, a little side business going on in, uh, of keto meals, and nice. just doing that on the side for now, and just uh, staying humble, following God, and and trying to be the best version of myself and uh, staying humble and try to help others as much as I can, and and that's all I can do. Nice. You have uh, Instagram or a website you want to shout out before we go? Uh, yeah, you can go to my Instagram. It's uh, chef uh, underscore Joe Rigo or uh, Facebook. I just have my personal Facebooks, but uh, Instagram is where I do most of my pictures for cooking. So with all the talk about, do you believe in aliens? Do I believe in what? Aliens. Aliens? <laughs> Only my own aliens in my head. All right, but let's say with all this talk we have with these sightings of UFOs and all that, right? Yeah. Let's say... Is he okay? No, listen. <laughs> let's say this spaceship comes down and kidnaps you. I don't know where okay. he's going with they this kidnap brother. you. Okay. And now you have to make them a meal. Okay. What in your head would you make? Entree, dessert, and drink? I'm making, you give these I'm making the, best, the best fucking cheeseburger they ever had. And that's it. No fries or nothing? Come no on. fries, just These a cheeseburger. Guys, a whole other cheeseburger, like, like McDonald's. <laughs> <laughs> what would you serve for a drink? Some wine? For a uh, drink? A soda? Coke, water, water H2O. Madeira, Madeira oh, wine. Yeah. Some Madeira <laughs> wine. What about dessert? Uh, dessert, I don't know. Quijada de nata. Yeah, quijada de nata. That's, there you go. Okay, <laughs> hey, you know, All right, guys. Joe, always a pleasure, Thank man. You, man. Thank, you. Thank, Thank you, man. Thank you for having me. Thank you for having you on. Appreciate you. you.